uh, the IT archive. Could you yes. in the chat give give the um, the uh, URL for it? I'm delighted to. I'll just ask if Troy has got it to hand right now, but I'll 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 fire up a browser and uh, I have got find it. it. I got okay. it. Oh, anyway. could you bang it in the chat? <laughs> anyway, I think we're about to, to start. I see it's now said six o'clock on my timer. Okay. Well, deal with that later then. Right. Well, I'm going to put, put up a screen for everyone. <clears throat> I'll explain what this is in a moment, but we're, we're about to have a talk on uh, Algol 60s, 60, 60 years since Algol 60 existed. Uh, and I gave a a talk uh, not so long ago, which was uh, on uh, saving digital media and so on. And I've got my little personal collection of digital media. <clears throat> and uh, you can see they're starting with paper tape, uh, cards, then in floppy disks, you notice, although they look the same size, that's going from eight inch down and so on. And then obviously uh, uh, cassettes, uh, uh, etc. cetera. Uh, but those very first reels you see there, that, that was actually, uh, my first ever attempt at programming at school. Uh, this was a plan for the camp in Dorset, and it was uh, writing programs in Algol 60. Uh, so those little tapes there do have some sort of Algol 60 program on them. I haven't read them for uh, quite a long time. Sometime I want to take them along and try and get them read and see what I wrote then. But uh, uh, that, that was my starting point for, for programming. So I'm very interested to hear this talk. Uh, so we're very lucky to have for you if you want it. Uh, I can read uh, paper tape for you if you okay, want. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Yes, I'll. I'll do, I'm planning to do that sometime. We're so busy during lockdown then. Yeah. Uh, so anyway, we have two speakers uh, for this meeting. Uh, this is our first attempt to give a, a, a talks on Zoom for the facts. So I hope everything goes okay. Uh, we were originally going to have one speaker, Tim Denver. Uh, who's uh, been in the industry for a long time. I've, I've uh, got his CV here, it's quite long. I'm going to pick out a few points. Uh, I mean, he originally studied mathematics at Cambridge, but he's inv been involved with all sorts of uh, formal methods organizations like Formal Methods Europe. He's been chair of PACS. Uh, he's been involved with the editorial board of the Formal Aspects of Computing uh, on the Passage series of Springer. Uh, BDM standardization, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So re reading his uh, affiliations backwards, a bit like Merlin, I mean, most recently he's worked uh, for TransLima, which I think is his company for doing all sorts of uh, things, uh, many formal methods based. Uh, but he's also been based as a professor, visiting professor at places like City University, Brunel and so on. Uh, he's also worked at a number of companies, so working backwards, He's been at Praxis, which is one of the uh, leading companies in the UK using formal methods, now part of Altran. So it's sort of, the name has disappeared, but it's still there. Uh, and then going back further uh, to more historic uh, uh, companies, STL, going back beyond that to ICL. And then in the end of the 60s or so, about uh, just before I was starting to write my Algol 60 uh, programming, he was working for Radix, which I don't know, but he was working on Algol 60 compilers himself then. Uh, so his early work, he was certainly involved with compiler design at the uh, uh, University of London Atlas Computing Service, for instance. Uh, he worked at Elliott Brothers. Uh, and ve very the very beginning of his list here, he was actually at Te Texas Instruments doing electronic circuits. So it's quite a similar background to me that I started off doing electronics and moved over there into uh, computing. Uh, now, Troy is our younger speaker. Uh, uh, so I'm going to just briefly tell you what uh, Troy has done. Uh, he's uh, studied computer science uh, originally. Then Troy went on to do a PhD in computer science at Newcastle University uh, with Cliff Jones. And he's, uh, Troy has been interested in uh, programming language semantics and the history of computing. Uh, so Troy is now a research assistant at Newcastle with a uh, funded uh, research assistant position. Uh, 
still working on the history of concurrency at the moment. Uh, so without further ado, I'll hand over, I think, first to Tim to start the talk off uh, on Algol 60. So I'm going to unshare my screen. And Tim, you can share your screen. Right, that's the title of the slide. So this is the Peter Lanton Semantics Seminar. Apart from its being 60 years old, why should we be talking about Algol 60? Algol 60 was defined with, I believe, semantics in mind. Uh, Peter Landon himself wrote a full semantics of Algol 60 in quite early days. It, his formal semantics of Algol was a, an example of a burgeoning new interest in the formal semantics of programming languages, which took place in the 60s and 70s. So I believe it is certainly an apposite topic for the Peter Landon Semantics Seminar. I shall start off with a short history of Algol 60. Uh, I'll need to speed over that quite quickly. Then I'll do a quick run through the authors of the revised report. Um, then I'll talk about the relationship of Algol with formal ideas, lambda calculus in particular, and then give a summary of Peter Landon's approach to uh, the formal description of Algol. After that, I will hand over to Troy for the next few sections. And finally, uh, if there's time, I'd like to say a word about the quote from Wittgenstein, which comes at the beginning of the description of the reference language in the revised report. So a short history of Algol 60. It all started with a conference in Zurich in 1958 that produced a preliminary report on the international algorithmic language, which later became known as Algol 58. Uh, it, was, um, it was published in the communications of ACM. Uh, there were lots and lots of meetings going on uh, in 1958 and 1959. Uh, an informal meeting was held in Mainz in November 58, which prompted uh, another meeting in Copenhagen in February 59, which was called an Algol Implementation Conference. And there were about 40 people there. Um, incidentally, they had started a, what they called a hardware group, which was devoted to devising the um, hard representation of Algol programs concerned itself with character sets and the limitations of input equipment and that sort of thing. Um, in 1959, the Algol Bulletin started, edited by Peter Maurer. Uh, there were 52 issues spanning 29 years altogether, starting in 59 and ending in 1988. Um, then that uh, there was the European Algol conference in Paris in November 59, and that uh, sparked off an important conference in January 1960. Uh, of those um, large numbers of people at the November conference, uh, they selected seven representatives from Europe. Uh, they were representing learned societies for um, computer science. In those days, the British Computer Society was regarded as a learned society. Um, so at the same time, there was interest shown in the USA. Uh, there were two, um, two user groups in the USA called SHARE and use, and each of those established working groups on Algol. And both of those organizations were represented on the ACM Committee on Programming Languages. Uh, the ACM Committee met in Washington in 
November 59, in parallel with all the meetings going on in Europe, uh, they assemble all these comments that have been uh, uh, put forward by people studying the, the report. Uh, and um, those were published again in the ACM communications. Amongst the uh, USA contributors, uh, again, seven representatives were selected to go to the January 1960, uh, but unfortunately, um, one of the reps uh, was, was killed in a road accident, uh, William Turansky, just before uh, the January con conference. Anyway, as a result of all that, a new draft report was developed from the original preliminary report in 58 and it that formed the basis of the um, revised report at the January 1960 conference and after January 1960 um, finally there was a conference in 1962 in Rome which was correcting uh, difficulties and eliminating ambiguities generally clarify that was edited by one of the authors, the only British one, Mike Woodger. So there were, in the end, 13 authors of the revised report um, from seven different countries, <coughs> um, one each from most of the European countries, six from the USA, and the report was dedicated to the memory of William Turansky. I shall uh, I shall go fairly rapidly over the individual authors because there are 13 of them. Um, it was 1960, you remember. Uh, computer science was not uh, an established um, discipline uh, insofar as there were no degree courses in computer science, as far as I, I can tell. Um, certainly, I was an undergraduate. And Cambridge in 1960. There wasn't a degree course in computer science. There was a, a diploma, a postgraduate diploma of one year, uh, which was um, uh, organized by what they call the uh, Mathematical Laboratory, uh, which had the EDSAC computer. It's interesting to note that Peter Nauer, the Danish um, author who um, edited uh, the Algol 60 report and who edited the series of Algol bulletins. Before Algol 60, he, he was at uh, the Cambridge Laboratory, it seemed, and he used ESSAC to calculate the orbits of comets. Um, I, I thought that was quite intriguing. Uh, Friedrich Fritz Bauer, uh, I think he must have been a man of uh, some charisma who generated uh, a certain um, slightly amused, but nonetheless respect. Troy tells me that he had two nicknames, one uh, amongst the Germans who um, called him uh, the Pope, uh, der Papst, and the British people referred to him as Uncle Fritz, apparently. He uh, was a PhD supervisor of uh, two people that I'm sure quite a few of you will have known, uh, David Greist and Manfred Roy. I didn't mean to put that in the past. Um, Van Wingarden, uh, he was for many, many years director of the Mathematisch Central in Am Amsterdam, had a background in engineering, soon moved to computing, he was involved in the first Dutch computer in 1952. Quite a lot of these authors, although they had a background in mathematics, um, were involved in the design of very early computers. Um, and indeed, well, as a matter of fact, when I was an undergraduate, I did a VAC job for ICT. It was just after it had been formed from a merger between Polarith and British Thompson Houston uh, eventually got absorbed into ICL. But uh, um, <coughs> if you 
done mathematics and done some mathematical logic, well, here you ought to be able to do some logic design, shouldn't you? That, I think, was the thinking. Um, so uh, a, lot of, a lot of these authors, the um, uh, European ones at any rate, um, were involved in the design of early computers. We see that they had backgrounds in maths, physics, uh, numerical analysis, uh, and so on. Um, the French author, Bernard Bourquois, uh, he moved on to natural language translation, in particular from Russian into French. They went on to various other things, some of them. Uh, the last European author, Mike Woodger, who the British representative amongst our list, um, he, when I last looked, as it were, was still alive. Um, but if he was born in 1923, that makes him 97, so he's a venerable uh, fellow. He was based at the National Physical Laboratory. He was involved in ACE, um, early computer, Albo, Ada, much active in IFIT working groups. His profile, uh, he has a profile in resurrection number 50. Resurrection is the newsletter of the Computer Conservation Society, and he has a, an early grounding in mathematical logic. I have crammed all six of the USA authors onto one slide here, um, and I've tried to arrange them in some sort of order of, um, uh, well, significance, perhaps. John Bacchus, uh, he's uh, the Bacchus of Bacchus normal form or Bacchus now form, um, an ACM Turing Award winner. Uh, he devised Fortran or was one of those who did so, concentrated on functional programming. Uh, he won various other awards. Alan Perlis, again, was involved with early computers and compilers. He was the very first ACM Turing Award winner. John McCarthy, mathematics again, another ACM Turing Award. Um, he's said to have coined the term artificial intelligence. Uh, Wakestein, he had a background in physics, engineering physics, international standards. He moved on after Algol 60 to automatic fingerprint, fingerprint recognition. The last two uh, USA authors were a bit more difficult to discover details of. Both of them were from industry, one IBM, the other GEC, but both of them were um, affiliated for a time with the University of Delft, I think, while, while they were doing work on Algol 60. I was in touch with the computer science department in Delft, uh, but they didn't find any uh, reference to these two. Um, their uh, group on programming languages um, uh, had only been, has only been in existence for a couple of years. Nonetheless, uh, the two of them were clearly had, had involvement with Al Gol and had things to say about it. Here's a photo of all of them, except for John McCarthy, uh, who was, I must presume, was taking the photo. You'll see they've all got their hands in the air. And um, Troy tells me that they are voting unanimously. Uh, the only time they did all vote unanimously, uh, the question they were voting on was, are you willing to have your photograph taken? So Algol 60 and Lambda Calculus. Um, I want to uh, I, I want to make this uh, uh, apparent by quoting two uh, verbating pieces of the Algol 60 report. The first one is about name replacement or call by name. <clears throat> any, any formal parameter not 
quoted in the value list is replaced by the corresponding actual parameter after enclosing that in parentheses wherever syntactically possible. It goes on to give an explanation of how you deal with the conflicts between identifiers. Um, uh, so in order, to, uh, in, in order to obey a procedure call, uh, you actually textually replace the formal parameter with the actual parameter, um, uh, its actual text, and then deal with clashes of identifiers. Another section, again, about procedure calls. Uh, finally, the procedure body modified as above, that's with the formal parameters replaced with actual parameters, um, is inserted in place of the procedure statement, that's the procedure call effectively, and executed. So the explanation in, in careful English in the Albol 60 report uh, says you have to do this textual replacement uh, and, and then um, execute the result. Um, this uh, is um, reminiscent of lambda calculus, the two types of conversion. Uh, the first one where you're replacing identifiers uh, corresponds to alpha conversion, um, where uh, if you have a, a lambda expression, uh, lambda v dot e, uh, the variable name v gets replaced by another variable v dash, uh, where e has every occurrence of v replaced by v dash. And the other, the beta conversion, does the same sort of thing with the uh, expression that um, follows uh, uh, the lambda v dot. Uh, so you, um, if you apply that um, lambda expression to E2, that's the, the result of that is um, to take E1 and replace all occurrences of V with the expression E2. And, and that uh, is um, effectively what is going on with a fair amount of extra elaboration uh, when uh, a procedure call uh, is executed, um, but it's all expressed in English in the, um, in the report. The Algol Bulletin was started in 1959, as I said, it's 52 issues. Um, and it was initiated at the Algol uh, uh, Implementation Conference in February 59. It was a forum for discussion of definition issues. Um, it was eventually taken over, uh, well, fairly soon taken over by IFIP Technical Committee 2.1, uh, their working group on Algol. And um, in that, later April 1962 conference edited by Mike Woodger, um, which was set up to correct errors and remove ambiguities. That was reported on in Algol Bulletin number 14. Um, and it, I think it was just about that time that uh, the Algol Bulletin was taken over by the IFIP uh, working group. Uh, the sort of um, the sort of discussion that went on, uh, one colleague of mine round about uh, the time that I was involved in uh, an Algol compiler, um, they were, seemed to be much more concerned with uh, properly and accurately interpreting uh, the words of the report than um, the actual um, technological um, uh, um, technological issues of, of the language. And one colleague of mine slightly cynically referred to uh, writers in the bulletin as Algol lawyers. Um, I want to just run over a few early implementations of Algol. Uh, the very first one was by uh, Edgar Dijkstra and Jack Donnevelt. 
uh, it was a compiler for the Electrologica X1. Um, and this was the very first, it was done very early in August 1960, um, which is, is impressive, I think. Uh, having had personal experience of the difficulties in writing an Algol 60 compiler. Another fairly early one, but uh, um, quite significant, was uh, Brian Randall and Earl Russell's Whetstone compiler, so-called, because that's where they were when they wrote it. It was for the KGF-9, um, but uh, they pretty much written the compiler before the KGF-9 was ready to, uh, to take it on board. So they made a reduced version for the JUICE computer. Um, Brian Randall writes about this again in Resurrection number 50. Um, and they did that around about 1964. Another early compiler that I had some uh, association with um, was Tony Hall's compiler for the Elliott 803. I think really it was 1962 to 63. Um, I wasn't, I was working for Elliott at the time. I rather to my regret wasn't in that project, but it was so to speak taking place in the next room. Uh, and uh, I felt rather envious of it, but they did share their ideas with uh, a whole lot of seminars. Um, we gave each other seminars uh, in, in those days at Elliot's, uh, and it was um, a very, a very good scheme for uh, um, improving morale and making us feel that we were all the, the technological avant-garde. Tony uh, Hall reports on this in Resurrection Number Forty Eight. Then uh, there was an Algol compiler for the. Atlas computer, uh, and I think this must have been around about 1965. At least I joined the University of London Atlas Computing Service, which um, uh, shared a building with the Institute of Computer Science that Jonathan mentioned. Um, Bob Hopgood uh, recalls that effort again in Resurrection Number 50. That that issue of resurrection uh, is pretty much devoted to Algol 50 because then um, it was the 50th anniversary of Algol 60, it was 10 years ago. Uh, and um, uh, so there was another kind of pleasant assonance for the 50th anniversary of Algol uh, in resurrection number 50. It was, I can assure you, used uh, for some years in particular by a chap who was working in my group, Chris Hodgson. He was on a contract for the meteorological office um, to, uh, we understood at the time, he, he was writing this program to simulate the Atlantic Ocean. And the meteorological office must have been rather pleased with it because they kept on asking him to add more and more bits and pieces to it. So this very large um, algal program grew and grew over a number of years. Now, another rather intriguing uh, early-ish um, Al Algol compiler was in the late 1960s. It was used by Richard Dawkins. Uh, he writes about it in this, in this book of his um, called uh, An Appetite for Wonder. It's this kind of autobiography. <coughs> um, and uh, what really intrigues me there is that um, Richard Dawkins seemed to be quite, well, very keen on using Algol 60, which uh, a compiler was written for it by a chap called Roger Abbott for the PDP-8. And Richard Dawkins um, in Algol 60 wrote a parser generator for a, a, a syntax definition a language which uh, was based on Chomsky's work just the same as BNF was. Um, the interesting thing was, the reason why Dawkins was doing this was he wanted to write the grammar of uh, not a textual language, but a, a language of um, uh, 
love songs uh, of various different species of crickets. And by being able to define uh, a variety of, of these um, uh, different languages, yeah, with a bit of suitable apparatus, he could actually generate simulations of the crickets' love songs. Uh, he wanted to uh, try this out scientifically by uh, seeing whether or not the different kinds of crickets were attracted or other ones by these different uh, uh, different formats of songs, but he didn't get as far as that um, in his research, apparently. Um, Wikipedia lists 20 compilers by the end of 65 and 26 by the end of 1972, but there are in fact many more um, because they didn't mention this one for the PDP-8 and nor did they mention one that I was involved with. But anyway, of those first 26 compilers listed, this is the, um, uh, the distribution of uh, uh, amongst countries. Now, I mentioned that Dijkstra and um, Donneveld wrote the very first one, and this was one of the Netherlands ones. The next four, in fact, all uh, came from the USA. Uh, so despite one might think of Algol 60 as kind of mo mostly European rather than uh, USA, but the USA were definitely very interested in it. Remember that 1960s, uh, it was still Cold War era, long time before the dissolution of the Soviet Union uh, and the well, to some extent, liberalization of Soviet bloc countries. Yet, um, uh, one might think of Algol being uh, a um, Western European, uh, a general Western effort, but quite a number of Soviet bloc countries wrote compilers, the USSR themselves, Estonia, Poland, uh, and China. Comic-Con, is the um, uh, communist economic community, a sort of uh, uh, communist uh, Soviet um, answer uh, in advance to the European economic community. Um, it consisted of a, a group of um, Soviet bloc countries, USSR, Poland, Czechoslovakia, Romania, Bulgaria, Hungary, I think. Um, so I can only suppose that in listing that uh, in, as, as a compiler, it must have been an international collaboration between some of the ComCon countries uh, altogether. <coughs> Peace Landon's semantic description is what I'll go into next. Um, uh, his paper um, was in two parts, published in the communications of the ACM uh, in 1965, but he did the work considerably earlier than that. Um, it was based on some lectures that he was invited to give by George Coloris at the, at Ulix, the University of London Institute of Computer Science um, in the spring of 1963. The, the general series of lectures that um, George uh, organized was on the logical foundations of programming. <clears throat> and uh, also Peter Landon's presented much the same paper, I think, um, titled A Formal Description of Algol 60 uh, at an IFIT working conference in 1964. Uh, that was not so much a public paper as his um, CACM papers uh, would have been. Uh, and of course, it always takes a, a little time, to say the least, to get papers published doing the original work. Uh, Peter Landon was not an author of the Algol 60 report, but he was an advisor at that April 62 conference in Rome, uh, which was edited by Mike Woodger. And these are direct quotes from Peter Landon's paper. Anyone familiar with both Church's Lambda Calculi 
and Algol 60 will have noticed a superficial resemblance, he writes. And again, some of the semantics of Algol 60 can be formalized by establishing a correspondence between expressions of Algol 60 and expressions in a modified form of Church's lambda notation. Um, he also writes, uh, formal syntax has been used to practical advantage by language designers and implementers. I guess he's referring, he must be referring to BNF and the like, which can be used to direct uh, the syntax analysis phase of a compiler. And he then writes, there might be analogous advantages in formal semantics. Um, excuse me a second. So um, I think, uh, well, I like to think that this is a seed uh, in Peter Landon's mind that maybe having a formal semantics definition might be able to drive um, the other part of a compiler, uh, a, a sort of foretelling of some of the work that Peter Mosses is trying to do in his semantics uh, implementation system. Uh, one slightly irritating thing I found in Peter Landon's paper was that he makes much use of terms like acronyms and so on, uh, which aren't defined, uh, but only defined in a previous paper the mechanical evaluation of expressions. Um, so you're pretty much obliged to read that one first before you read, uh, before you can absorb all the rest. He defines the semantics in an operational way in terms of an abstract machine uh, that interprets a language similar to lambda notation. Um, in general, I think, Algol has an ambivalence. It tries to be simultaneously an abstraction of what an imperative computer can do. Um, otherwise, why would it have things like go-to statements and the horrible switch blocks, uh, which are easy enough to implement, but um, hard to, to write a semantics for, especially in the context of recursive procedures and so on. It tries to be that, and at the same time, an expression of some mathematics that can be evaluated by a computing machine. Um, so it's, on the one hand, trying to be a, a decent expression of what computers to do, and on the, on the other hand, uh, trying to like, formulate mathematics that a computer can carry out. His uh, semantic description is, in his own words, over tolerance. Again, quoting directly from his report, um, a mismatch will not lead to a rejection if the procedure is never applied. Now, the Algol 60 report doesn't, doesn't want to let you do that if there's, if there's a fault in um, uh, a tight mismatch, for example, uh, between a formal and an actual parameter that can be detected at syntax analysis time, then that program should be rejected, um, even, uh, even though you could, you could actually um, uh, execute it. So a compiler built to that model would run programs that other correct compilers would legitimately um, reject. Um, and he gives initial values to declarations, uh, which again is not, uh, uh, not really what the report requires. But perhaps we should be tolerant, I, I think, uh, Peter Landon's semantic description is a demonstration of um, what can be done semantically in defining algal 60. It's not a definition. And that means, that domain theoretic means of dealing with undefined values wasn't to be conceived um, for some eight years. Um, well, I think I shall finish there. And um, uh, for now, uh, I'll only have a few words to say at the end. I'll 
it's time I hand it over to Troy, give you Troy um, time enough to say your part. So over to you, Troy. Right, thank you very much, Tim. Let me set up sharing. You get a brief glimpse of my wallpaper and then I will start my slideshow. Okay, so um, I'm going to um, talk about some work that largely comes from my, um, my PhD research, which was into the history of formal definitions for semantics for programming languages. Um, and in particular, I co-authored a paper with Cliff Jones called Four Formal Descriptions of Algol 60 in the Historical Context. Um, and, and particularly that will be relevant to this particular talk here. Um, references are, are all given at the end of the slides and I'm not going to hover on them, but uh, you can get the slides later and check them out if you want to. So I'm going to give some return generally to the sort of atmosphere about programming in the 1960s discuss four and a half other Algol 60 descriptions, uh, giving some brief history of each and some technical flavor. Uh, and then I'll finish by concluding, uh, considering briefly why Algol was considered interesting in the past and why we might think so now. Um, I'm aware this is a, a formal aspects group, so there's gonna be some technical detail, but there are also uh, plenty of um, uh, historians in the audience. So hopefully I'll try to include some uh, more historical stuff too. Right, so uh, towards the end of the 1950s and into the 1960s, um, programming was in something of a transition period away from the um, machine codes and explicit ties to uh, particular computers and heading in the direction of more generality and more abstraction. Uh, I've highlighted IPL and LISP particularly here um, which there's an interesting point about how, uh, as uh, Newell, Simon and Shaw in the case of LISP and John McCarthy in the case of IPL, or rather the other way around, um, I apologize for that. They were trying to find ways to express concepts from artificial intelligence, things to do with thought, which were quite different from the more standard, very numerical applications of computers up to that point. Uh, the main use of computers in the early period, the 40s and 50s, was for especially numerical analysis. Um, it's interesting to note as a sidebar that the S expression form of LISP, uh, according to McCarthy, was, quote, included to impress logicians, end quote, and in fact a more Fortran-like syntax was eventually planned for the language, although the success of the S expression form meant that it didn't actually come out. Um, Another instance of this kind of non-numerical computation is the summer school organized by Christopher Strachey in 1963, which stemmed out of an argument between him and Leslie Fox in the pages of, uh, I think it was possibly even the computer journal. I don't remember which it was now. Um, but Fox was trying to say, look, computers are tools for doing mathematical um, calculations. And Strachey was saying, well, you can do that, but you can also do more symbolic computation. And, and really, isn't that the more interesting thing? And then this summer school in 1963 was all about non-numerical computation. And one of the speakers was Peter Landin, and he talked about his Lambda Calculus approach. And that's the title of the paper is a Lambda Calculus approach. Um, this quotation here is a quotation from Christopher Strachey, and he's talking there about his experience of working on the programming language CPL. Uh, he says, quote, this gives rise to a rather vague feeling of unease, and though we think we know what we mean about certain language constructs, we are not altogether happy that we have really got to the bottom of the concepts involved, end quote. Uh, this reflects another general trend in programming at the time, which was a desire to really understand what was going on with, with programming, as there were new applications and newer investigations into uh, programming away from standard use like a, a glorified calculator. Um, there was a bit of an unease about what exactly was going on. Uh, John McCarthy, to give another example, was interested in the what he called mathematical theory of computation, about which I'll talk a little more on the next slide. Um, the publication of Algol 58, or International Algebraic Language, and then International Algorithmic Language, as it was called earlier, um, heralded an excitement for formal descriptions. The formalized syntax that was used in those documents um, seems to be a much more efficient way of representing what could be expressed in the language. 
and uh, the conclusion to the initial report promises a formal semantics along the same lines. Um, it's interesting to note the transition from algebraic to algorithmic. Does this maybe hint at the, the changing attitudes in programming away from something very number focused towards something a little bit more general? Uh, there's a paper by Helena Duranova and Gerard Alberts on this, um, the reference for which you can find at the end. And then finally, the last thing I'm going to mention uh, is the Formal Language Description Languages Conference. This is the one at which Peter Landin presented uh, the version of his ideas that Tim mentioned. Um, this was held at Baden by Wien near Vienna in 1964, September 1964. It was the first IFIP working conference, in fact, and it was intended to be a sort of a meeting of minds. Uh, uh, it was invitation only and um, language implementers and language designers were both brought along. And there was also an element of theory versus practice, um, as well as um, uh, people who are interested in formal language description, i.e. the formal description of programming languages, and people who are interested in formal language theory. And you can see papers along both those lines in the proceedings. Okay, um, so I'm going to, this is the, the first description that I want to talk about. This is the, uh, the sort of half description, um, because this is only a micro algon. This was written by John McCarthy and presented at the FLDL conference. Um, and McCarthy had been working on the mathematical theory of computation. Um, in an early 1960s paper, he explicitly put this in the context of um, the, the principles of scientific uh, advancement. He said, just like Kepler's laws of planetary motion can be derived from Newton's laws of motion, we want to know what are the basic, basic principles of computation and from them, what can we derive? And to him, the way that this had to be achieved was by looking at and examining programming languages and really getting to grips with what they were doing, as well as determining their correctness. So part of this was he proposed a way of writing formal syntax and formal semantics of programming languages. And you can clearly see that he'd been, he'd been working on Lisp at that time. You can see the, the sort of the style of the presentation is very Lisp-like. There are recursive functions. Um, and um, the sort of even the, the sort of the classic Lisp multiple parentheses show up in his uh, in his approach. Um, uh, I'll do a little bit more about the technical details on the next slide. Um, but basically, the core idea was a state vector modif models the state of computation, and then statements are regarded as functions that modify that state vector. Uh, the photo here is John McCarthy, probably in the nineteen sixties. Um, you can just about tell, perhaps, that that's an IBM 7090 in the background, which gives you a hint of the date. Uh, you can also figure it out from the fact that it's still black in his hair. Okay, so a little bit of detail about McCarthy's semantics then. This is what I'm going to show for each of these descriptions. It's a very sort of top level overview, what you might call the semantic function. The micro function takes a program pi. Uh, and a state, an initial starting state, or for the beginning of the program interpretation, or an intermediate one, uh, and a statement number. Uh, technically, it's considered part of the state, but it's treated separately. And then it gives a state. So um, it's a sort of, you can see here that there's an abstract conception of a machine and it has an interpretation function. And you can see this as a, a clear uh, inspiration for what later becomes operational semantics. But on the other hand, it's also presented as one big function with lambda terms in it. And you can see also there how this is uh, an early inspiration for denotational semantics as well. Um, although I should say that by 1964, Christopher Strachey also had his own ideas about using functions. Uh, nevertheless, this was the very first paper that I read when I started researching the history of programming language semantics. And I think it's an important one. It was a small and neat definition um, in fact, the semantic function takes up half a page, and that's the entirety of the semantics, but it doesn't cover very much. You can do assignments, conditional statements, and jumps, and that's it. A much bigger uh, definition is the Vienna definition language, VDL, operational description, um, uh, published uh, in 1968. This is the definition of Algol 60 in 1968. Uh, as a brief history, um, the IBM laboratory in Vienna had taken on the task of writing a formal description for PL1 in 1964. Uh, that's when they took on the task. And um, by, uh, when would it be? The end of 1966, I think they published the first version of that. Uh, and it met with some criticism because it was, um, 
uh, very long and very bulky, and the leader of the laboratory, Heinz Semenek, wanted to demonstrate that this approach uh, was just as feasible for a smaller lab. Um, also at the same time, they had a new person joining the lab, the logician Peter Lauer, and um, he was asked to author the Algol 60 description, also as a method to bring him up to speed too. Um, the core idea here is to use an abstract machine to represent the state of computation, and it's a very big state um, because it was originally uh, defined for PL1. Um, the basic idea is, um, yeah, big state and statements altering the machine. Uh, in fact, it was so complicated it ended up giving operational semantics a bit of a bad name. Um, so before we look at that, let's have a quick photograph. Um, this is probably taken around 1964. Note the Tower of Babel in the background, that's Bruegel's, it was a favour of Seminex. Um, and uh, some of the members of the lab here, uh, I'll just point out some of them, Peter Lucas, uh, who was one of the major intellectual drivers, Kurt Valk was one of the managers, that's Heinz Semenek, who ran the lab, and on the right, that's uh, Norbert Teufelhart, without whom Semenek could not have run the lab, who was the efficient adjutant. Um, you can tell it's the 1960s because there's ashtrays on the table. Right, a little bit on the semantics of VDL. Um, an interpretation function, uh, int, int program, uh, processes the overall program. It takes an abstract program which is to say a, uh, a parsed structural representation of the program, um, taking some obvious inspiration from McCarthy from the abstract syntax, and a state represented by Xi, and returns a set of states. Uh, now, the reason it's a set is because PL1 had uh, parallelism called tasking, and um, the parallelism was represented by trees of potential executions, which were stored in the control, that's the C, and control information, CI, parts of the state. Um, any of the leaves of this tree would be valid successor states. And um, uh, that parallelism was not really um, uh, utilized in the Algol 60 definition. The other elements of the state, uh, denotation directory um, the, and the environment together associated names and values, uh, the dump was uh, about managing contexts and the unique name counter coped with things like own variables. Um, you can see here some obvious Peter Landin uh, influence if you've seen any of his papers on semantics, the Stack Environment Control Dump Machine, SECD. You see this is an expanded version of that essentially. Now VDL was a very powerful definition method. It could cope with PL1, a huge language, um, and uh, it could also be used to prove some different properties about um, languages and programs written in those languages, but it was awkward to use because of the size and complexity of it. So the next definition I'm going to talk about is uh, another operational description written in 1972, um, and it stems out of the earlier Vienna work. Uh, Cliff Jones had been on assignment in Vienna in 1968, um, and there he'd been working on finding ways to use this formal definition um, to help with language design and to proving properties and so on, uh, mainly in combination with Peter Lucas and uh, Wolfgang Henharper. Um, and uh, together with Henharper, Jones had worked on a, an alternative jump handling method, which is called the exit mechanism. Um, the idea was that, uh, quote, jumps shouldn't take the machine by surprise, end quote which was something that had happened in the previous VDL definition where the, the, the tree of executions was sort of slashed and totally replaced with a new one when there was a jump. Um, this attempt to prove properties about the programs proved to be difficult, uh, largely because it, the state was really big and every single interpretation function had the potential of changing everything in the state. Now, most of the time it didn't, but um, it had to be proved that most statements left everything else unchanged, and that turned out to be an unnecessarily difficult task. So when Jones returned back to IBM Hursley in 1970, um, uh, he worked on a, a new um, kind of approach with a smaller state and this new exit mechanism. Um, it also implemented the copy rule um, for procedures rather than the, uh, the more complex environment and dump based method. Um, this uh, Algol 60 definition was authored by Jones, um, Dave Allen and Dave Chapman. Um, 
And um, the basic idea of this exit mechanism was to uh, pass about, along with these small state components, um, uh, an ABN compound, an abnormal um, element, which would be present um, if there had been a jump, and if there wasn't, then it would just be null. Okay, so uh, the overall um, semantic function here, an abstract program is taken in uh, along with a starting state, and then an end state is given. And the states here are much smaller. There's a value list VL and a denotation and directory DN, and then this optional uh, ABN component. It would contain a label in the case of a jump, and it would be empty if there wasn't a jump. So uh, interpretation would go on if there was no um, label there, and if there was a label, then it would have to be caught um, using a TIXI, that's exit spelled backwards, combinator. Um, one other interesting thing about this um, uh, report um, is that it was printed with large gaps in it. The idea was that you could then um, align the uh, definition with the Algol report. I believe it was the revised report that it was based on. And then they would line up with each other. So the, um, the algal report and the formal definition could be put next to each other. Um, this is a nice idea that wasn't used in any of the other descriptions. Okay, so the uh, third or third and a half description that I'm talking about is the denotational semantics description written by Peter Mosses in 1974. And I must apologize to Peter, who I believe is here tonight, for the fact that I've included the photo of Christopher Strachey rather than of him, but this is because I didn't have a contemporary photo of Peter from that time, so apologies. Um, plus also this photo of Christopher is from the Formal Language Description Languages Conference, so it has a nice um, running theme. So a very rough history of denotational semantics. Strachey had become interested in programming languages whilst uh, working as an independent computing consultant in the early 1960s. Uh, Peter Landin was his sole employee and the two of them worked together for about three years, um, uh, including writing some, doing some work on the autocode for the Ferranti Pegasus. Uh, during that time, Landin got interested in programming languages um, and uh, Strachey also became interested in programming languages. Uh, side note, uh, I didn't hear, I didn't know about the George Caloris lectures until Tim mentioned them to me, so I'm not sure quite what place they have in this. Okay, following his consulting work, Strachey ended up working on the programming language CPL with Morris Wilts and uh, some other people, including uh, Dave Barron and Martin Richards. Um, and during that time, uh, this vague feeling of unease that I mentioned at the beginning of this talk uh, began to crop up to him. Strachey decided that the best way to model computation was to use functions because they were well-known mathematical constructs with well-known properties and uh, handling them ought to be easier than handling the sort of abstract machines that were popular in operational semantics at the time. Strachey initially went for an untyped lambda calculus using the Y combinator um, for handling recursion and iteration, as Landin had used, before meeting Dana Scott, a logician in Vienna in 1969, uh, at a meeting of IFIP Working Group 2.2. Um, and um, Scott and Strachey hit it off, and uh, Scott produced uh, his domain theory, which created a, uh, a more secure foundation for the semantic style which was first called mathematical semantics um, and then also known as Scott Strachey semantics and later was given the name denotational semantics uh, as a kind of um, an acknowledgement that other forms of semantics could be mathematical as well. Okay, so let's talk about the Algol 60 definition. Um, Peter Mosses was working for his DFIL um, on a semantics implementation system, SIS. The idea was that you could feed this system a definition a uh, semantic definition written in the denotation of semantic style, and it would give you a compiler. Uh, in theory, that should work. Um, the, um, sorry, I was just slightly confused because my Siri activated. <coughs> Go away. Right, I do apologize. Okay, so the semantics implementation system, um, in order to be fed to a compiler, uh, had to have a formalized meta language, and this was called the Mathematical Semantics Language, MSL. Um, and to sort of demonstrate this whole idea, this MSL idea, 
and also to attempt to provide a, quote, shorter and less algorithmic, end quote, definition of ALGOL 60 than the uh, Alan Chapman Jones or Landin ones, um, Moss is embarked on writing this uh, denotational semantics description of ALGOL 60. Uh, the shorter and less algorithmic quote is from that um, document. Um, so, a little bit on the semantic details for this. Um, it was a little tricky to sort of pull it apart and get this out of the uh, out of the report. Um, the formalized meta language is a was a little hard for me to understand. I apologize, but I think I've got the sense of it here. The compiler function is the sort of top level program uh, is the top level function, and um, all the functions here are curried. It, uh, takes a program which is a, a deduction tree, which sort of works a bit like an abstract syntax, it's a structural program, plus an environment, um, and then gives you a continuation to continuation. No, sorry, it takes a program, takes an environment, takes a continuation, and gives you a continuation. And continuations are um, functions from state to state, or store to store, as, as uh, straight you would have said, um, slightly complicated by the need to manage areas which control the uh, blocks and procedures uh, and sort of cope with whatever context is uh, active at the time. Uh, it's sort of classic full bone denotational semantics um, and um, uh, yeah, the continuations are the main focus. Sorry, I've lost my notes. I'm just going to see if they appear if I go forward and back. Yeah, there we go. Nope, I said everything that I wanted to say. Good. Um, I'm aware of the time, so let's move on to the final one that I'm going to talk about. Uh, this is another denotational semantics description, uh, this time back to Vienna again. Um, and the background to this is that uh, in the early 1970s, IBM were working on a, a radical new machine um, architecture, which they were referring to as the Future Systems Project. Uh, as part of this, they wanted to provide a compiler for PL1, and the task was given to the IBM laboratory in Vienna. They agreed to do it on the proviso that they could first write a uh, formal definition of it. And um, Cliff Jones was asked to be a part of that project. Uh, he remembers that Peter Lucas called him up and before Lucas had even finished explaining what he wanted him to do, Jones had already agreed to come along. It was an exciting opportunity. So in the time that Jones had been back uh, in the UK, he'd heard Stretchy lecture on the denotational semantics and Hans Beckett, another one of the major intellectual drivers at the lab, had spent a year with Peter Landin at Queen Mary in the late 1960s. So between the two of them, they had heard about the denotational semantics ideas and thought this was the way to go um, in trying to uh, define programming languages. Um, they wrote a definition of PL1, first of all, the lab did, and that was published in 1974. And although it was denotational um, at its base, it looked more like a, an earlier Vienna publication with its sort of meta language uh, being more um, uh, wordy. And it used the exit mechanism and Tixi combinator rather than continuations. Um, unfortunately, in what was known as the Valentine's Day Massacre in, I believe, 1975, February 1975, the Future Systems Project was killed, but uh, Cliff Jones and Dinas Bjorna, who joined the lab um, around about the same time as Jones, salvaged the uh, definition method, the Bjorna definition method. Um, this was the first use of VDM and refers to this uh, denotational semantics of programming languages but with a meta language called meta4, that's meta and then a dash and then IV. It's a nice little pun that I genuinely only got when I was putting this slideshow together. Um, uh, originally a language, uh, a programming language description method, it was later adapted to um, specifying individual programs. Uh, as part of the um, salvaging of VDM and the publication in a book, uh, there was an ALGOL 60 definition written as a sort of a proof of concept authored by Cliff Jones and Wolfgang Henharpel. Uh, it appeared in the 1978 publication of the, of the book, and then uh, when the book was republished in 1982, um, the aim uh, for this was uh, an attempt to provide uh, equal abstraction to Mosses, uh, but more readable, according to the introduction to this particular report. Sorry, did I hear somebody saying something there? Am I being nudged for time or something? No, okay, quick chat for chat, we're good. 
Let me continue rattling along. A brief description of the semantics of VDM. Again, we can see a top level meaning function looking pretty similar to the Moss's one, uh, with the main um, difference being the inclusion of this abnormal part, which um, fulfills the same uh, behavior that it did in the earlier 1972 definition. Um, the uh, trick or a trick to this was that the semicolon combinator was defined to be functional composition. Um, except if an abnormal uh, part was present, in which case then the second part of the composition would be skipped until a tipsy in the block found it, uh, and then the label would be handled and it would all be turned into a nice jump. Um, this also gave the trick of meaning that you could read this definition operationally, uh, rather than composing the two functions uh, for two um, sequential statements, you could read it as one followed by the other. Okay, that concludes my bit about the four and a half definitions of Algol 60. Let's talk a little bit about some fascination with Algol. Um, at the time, it really was, uh, it was regarded quite highly in certain circles. Um, there's a quotation here from Tony Hall, which sort of encapsulates this, um, this almost elitist uh, satisfaction with Algol 60, uh, a language so far ahead of its time that it was not only an improvement on its predecessors, but also on nearly all of its successors. Um, it became seen as something of the, uh, the pinnacle of European computer science, according to David Nofra. It was seen as mathematical, precise, elegant, but inefficient. And actually, as Nofra points out, it was really an equally American project. And um, it was more of a sort of a stereotype than any actual grounding in fact uh, with this um, idea. Nevertheless, there was certainly an algal culture around in the 1960s and um, they would refer to themselves with things like the algal community or the algal effort, um, emphasizing a sort of a shared research agenda. Um, Algol 60 was, I'd like to think, something of a benchmark. Um, there was certainly a time period when producing an Algol 60 compiler for your machine was a demonstration that your machine was a, you know, a, a bang up, proper, good machine. Um, and that if as a research group you could provide an Algol 60 uh, compiler, then you were doing a good job. Um, we've already seen that there were these many, many definitions of Algol 60. I think it's not a stretch to say that Algol 60 is probably the most formally defined programming language of all time. And it kind of took this role because it was, well, I'll say why on the next slide, actually. I'm predict over predicting myself a little bit here. Um, regarding influence, influence here, um, I've lifted a few languages which came out of the Algol effort. These first ones, uh, Jovial and Neliac especially, were more dialects of IAL and uh, had more popularity in America. Algol was a uh, Germanic effort for a much more efficient Algol compiler. And then Pascal um, grew out of uh, Niklaus Fiat's uh, suggestions for a successor to Algol 60 called Algol W. Um, CPL was influenced by Algol and uh, went on to, through a, a sort of a, uh, a chain of influences, become C, sort of become. Uh, and uh, similar uh, also source influence from Algol. So we can see it being really an influence on a lot of important programming languages. Uh, and finally, the algorithm section in the communications of the ACM tended to use Algol for almost all of its algorithms. Uh, I believe only one algorithm in PL1 was ever submitted to the CACM algorithms. Um, so why then? Why this fascination with Algol? Um, well, it had a lot of features, um, and indeed some of those, such as statement declaration type and block, really gained their popularity thanks to Algol. Um, and um, the, the language was designed deliberately with generality in mind. It was a general purpose programming language in that you could uh, write almost any kind of program in it, not just numerical ones. It was not aimed for a particular machine. And it was also uh, thanks to um, the work of Dijkstra and von Weinhardt in particular, um, free from a certain level of arbitrary restriction. The Amsterdam has argued that uh, if, you could, if you could treat a particular uh, variable in one way, then you won't be able to treat the same variable of another type in the same way. 
and that eventually became the orthogonality principle in Algol 68. There's an article by this, uh, on this by Alberts and Daylight. Um, machine independence also uh, created uh, an important shift in the way people thought about programming languages. If the, rather than earlier ones where implementations defined the language, um, a definition on paper makes the document the ultimate source of referent. The document therefore has to be right, and you really therefore want to properly interrogate this paper document to make sure that it's doing the right things. And when you're doing that, you can't just run something and see what happens. You have to use some more um, abstract techniques. So uh, this opens the door for formalisms and reifies programming languages of, of objects of study in their own right. As Priestley wrote, uh, there's a sort of a paradigm shift um, around the time of Algol into programming languages becoming objects of study. Um, and on languages, um, there's a good paper by Priestley and Offer and Alberts about the use of language as a metaphor to refer to computation. Um, Dijkstra wrote in the 60s even that the formalization of the language provided an academic impetus to study programming languages, um, rather than just programming languages being a means to express thoughts and to write programs, they became things to look at and therefore interrogated more and this, uh, this kind of created this sort of loop, this feedback loop of being interested in programming languages, writing formalization and therefore being able to justify the academic focus this way. Um, I'll just quickly mention Algol-like uh, and here's a, an appearance of Fraser Duncan also at FLDL, he was mentioned in the chat earlier. Um, in, his, uh, in a comment after one of the talks, um, I think it was Tom Steele's talk, he mentioned the phrase Algol-like had come to be so widely used during the conference. The only thing that everybody could agree on was that Algol itself was not an Algol-like language. Uh, what did they mean by Algol-like? That it was regular, it had blocks and procedures, it had recursion, that it was generally nice to work with and people weren't quite so happy with Algol itself. Okay, so my final slide now. Um, let's talk about some of the moves away from Algol. Uh, one of the things that comes up always is the lack of industrial support. Now there are uh, counter examples to that, such as Boulle in France, as Mounier Kuhn has written about, and Tim mentioned earlier some examples of compilers, um, but it did not have the kind of commercial support that other programming languages enjoyed. Partially that's probably due to just uh, industrial inertia. Um, another one was that it wasn't a product, and so big companies like IBM were loath to support something they didn't have control over themselves, and that they couldn't sell to their uh, customers. Um, David Nofra makes the point that the actual research paradigm around Algol was to its detriment because it then enforced the view of uh, Algol as an object of research study rather than as something that was useful to customers in a real practical industrial setting. Uh, the Algol 68 fiasco I'm not going to get into, but uh, it's worth pointing out that it uh, scared working groups, especially Algol working groups, away from committee work for a long time and led to the demise of Algol products and, and somewhat soured the end of the Algol experience. Uh, Algol, I'd like to say, is something of a turning point. I'm hesitant to say that it's like a revolution or a, a paradigm shift in itself, because that's not the sort of thing that gets you applause from historians. Uh, but rather part of a trend, a turning point away from languages being really tied to machines and towards programs being the, the object of study with software projects getting larger and uh, programming languages getting more complicated, uh, a general shift away from machines through programming languages and towards individual um, programs and software engineering as a concept I see Algol as kind of the turning point in the middle of that loop, sitting in the, uh, the, the 1960s. Uh, the 1960s, a good time for formalization and for focus on programming languages, and really a kind of a birth period for computer science in the European sense. So I want to argue. Uh, I have a, an unpublished submitted for publication paper on that topic, which will hopefully be coming out soon. And so to wrap this up then, here's the references to my own work on the subject. You can get copies of uh, either the papers or technical report versions of the papers uh, from my webpage, which is on my first slide. Um, 
here's the algal definitions that I've mentioned, um, the references to them, and then some more general references, some more historical references. Right, I almost got in under 30 minutes, not quite, but I will now hand back to uh, Tim to wrap us up. Thank you very much, and I need to stop my sharing. Yep, yeah, thank you. Over to you, Tim. Right. I'm just trying to get this guy. Come on. It's thick and sky and I can see. Is it? Yes, that's right. But I'm trying to turn it into a slideshow. And that's... Oh dear. Um, well, maybe I'll just... Yeah, we can still see it well enough. Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll put it on. There we go. Uh, right. Um, the reports, uh, the description of the reference language within the report starts with this quote from Wittgenstein. Um, they don't attribute it to any particular work of Wittgenstein, but I've traced it to two um, sections of the Tractatus Logico Philosophicus. The second clause of the quote is almost identical to the last sentence of the Tractatus, and the first clause seems to be a paraphrase of 4.116. Um, I've translated the first clause in the spirit of C.K. Ogden, who was the official translator of the Tractatus. And I followed that with Ogden's actual translation of the last sentence. What can be said at all can be said clearly, and whereof one cannot speak, thereof one must be silent. Um, now the next slide. The Tractatus starts with this um, first, uh, first couple of sentences. Um, I have often thought that some of the best computer scientists reveal an influence from Wittgenstein, especially this Tractatus. The world, as seen by a point of control in a computer program, is the set of all variables that are in the scope of that point. And the state of that world is the value of those variables at that dynamic point. One might say that a principle of programs as predicates equates a state of the programmed world with a set of all true propositions about it. That is the facts or everything that is the case. I wonder if it would be whimsical to conclude that the authors of the Algol 60 report were presaging the concept of programs as predicates. Um, Troy mentioned uh, the kind of spirit of the time uh, of um, semantics of programming languages. Uh, and there was a parallel spirit of the time in philosophy, which started to focus on linguistic philosophy, uh, which uh, to put it as a caricature, might be saying that uh, things um, don't exist, or all that does exist, are the statements that we can make about things. And I can see a sort of uh, going hand in hand between that movement in philosophy and the movement towards um, semantics uh, in computer science. That's all I have to say. This is a list of my references. Uh, I would like to make two acknowledgements. Uh, one is to Case Pronk, and I noticed that I think he's in our audience. He sent me a number of private communications 
which helped me uh, chase up some details of, of the authors. He sent me a list of um, the USA computer scientists who um, have the surname of Katz. Um, and I emailed all of them, there were about eight or 10 or so, uh, to ask them if there were any relation to Charlie Katz, who was one of the authors from the USA of, of the uh, revised report. To my amazement, they all replied within a day or two, um, every single one of them, uh, very politely saying, um, uh, no, sorry, very interesting, but I'm no relation to Charlie Katz. Um, I'd also like to recommend this book by Mike Gordon. Um, his chapter four uh, uh, has a, a wonderful um, introduction to the uh, influence of lambda calculus on computer science. And then if anyone wants to learn about the lambda calculus, uh, the rest of his chapter is a very good tutorial. So that's all. Uh, thank you, Troy, very much indeed for your contribution. And um, over to you, Jonathan, back as chairman. Thank you. Well, thank you very much to both of you, uh, Tim and Troy. I'll, I'll give you a little. It's difficult. Anyone else who wants to clap and unmute briefly? <laughs> uh, well, one thing I'll say is if John is there, John Cook, I lost contact and I'm no longer a host. You, only you have the power to make anyone a host now. So if you can do that, if you're there, John, uh, I can't see you or hear you, uh, but at least I can talk to everyone and hopefully I can organize questions. So if anyone wants to I ask do. a question, we can, we can stay on for a while. Uh, thank you, John, if you can make me host, we, where you have to point to me and uh, so select me to be a host. Okay. But if you're able, but anyway, are there any questions? If you want to, yes, we can try yes. by just unmuting. Uh, hi, everyone. Okay. Uh, okay. I'm Simone Martini from Bologna, Italy, and I have a question for Tim. Now, you mentioned several times the relations between the ALGO um, report, the, 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 the procedures definition, and um, you know, the passing by name and lambda calculus. Do we have any evidence? That this, that this relation was clear to the ALGOL committee at the time it was defined the language, or it is a creation of Peter? Um, I don't have any evidence that it was in the minds of the uh, writers of the ALGOL 60 report at the time, um, but uh, it's something that I noticed and uh, then I discovered that Peter Landon I've noticed the same thing when I read uh, his paper. Um, that's all I can say, really. Um, but, uh, uh, no, there's um, nothing in the report or, or anything else that authors have written to uh, to indicate precisely that they had that and the calculus in mind. Yeah, thank you. I have read something somewhere about there being a bit, some, some, at one of the meetings, there was a discussion of, well, this is basically the same as some, as Lambda Calculus, so why don't we just explicitly say that it is? Unfortunately, I only just, I, I just, I remember that. I don't have a citation for it. I don't remember where I saw it, but I do believe that that was mentioned at some point. Ah, no, here we go. It's all right, I found it. Um, in uh, Peter Landin's um, FLDL talk, the one given in 1964, uh, Fritz Bauer commented and said that during the, quote, chaos, end quote, of trying to fix the semantics of procedures, there was a group advocating the use of lambda calculus in this context, uh, but it didn't end up happening. So, uh, yes there is some evidence that they were aware of Lambda Calculus. Great, thanks. Uh, I'll just ask again, John, if you could look at the chat and make me into a host. Uh, at the moment, we're losing the recording of this bit. Uh, thank you. Uh, Troy may have a recording, hopefully. 
Anyway, if anyone else has got a question while John tries to do that, uh, just uh, unmute and ask. Uh, just a comment, really. Well, after um, Tim had written his uh, article, Facts, Facts, I, I lacked into Algol because I've been on a short course in the 60s. And as a result of this, I found a document which I can't find now. Whole load of algorithms um, are creating mathematical physics uh, functions uh, using Algol. And I wondered if that was, who it was, it sort of disappeared into the, into the abyss of mathematical physicists, <laughs> um, at, you know, after it was first produced. You know, you said it wasn't picked up, but I wonder if that's who it was. If I find it, I'll send it to Tim, but I can't find it at the moment. Okay, that's it. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Margaret. Uh, Any other comments? I have a comment. Go yes, ahead. Uh, I might uh, add a comment. Uh, one thing that Troy didn't forgot, forgot to mention, I think, is the wonderful library of semantic descriptions that Cliff Jones has assembled on his web pages. Uh, these were um, uh, dig digitized, and they have uh, not only the, uh, the the visual presentation of the original documents, but also a PDF layer underneath with uh, the source text, so you can actually search in these documents. That, that includes my Algol 60 description and, and Cliff Jones's own. Uh, Algol descriptions. I don't know if Cliff is online. He'd like to say a bit more about it. Well, I can see Cliff there. So. Uh, I, I have nothing to add. Thank you very much, Peter, for pointing yeah. it out. I'd forgotten. Yeah, thank you. I'll find it and I'll put it in the chat. Any other questions? I have a, I have a question. Go ahead. Uh, one of the speakers mentioned, uh, I think, a paper by maybe a Priestley or a Duncan called on language. And I, I missed that reference and was curious what it was. Uh, the, uh, the entrance of the language metaphor to describe programming. Uh, that... Yes, I think that's it, yes. Yeah, okay, I'll get that too. <laughs> it, it, it is in my slides, uh, but I can put the reference in the chat easily enough. Great, thank you. Uh, I have a, a comment and a question. Um, it's, uh, I mean, clearly, uh, if you uh, look at Algo, some some aspects are clearly uh, reminiscent of lambda calculus. I mean, uh, in particular, uh, call by name and uh, you know, also Jensen's device, which is essentially just the lambda. But um, at the time, uh, um, call by name. Is, uh, is not very easy to uh, implement, it's only inefficient and uh, got replaced in later languages by call by reference. Now, uh, there are some, some suggestions that um, it was a call my name was, was a mistake and that they really meant call by reference. They just didn't describe it properly or, or uh, some reason. On the other hand, it, it really just co um, mirrors um, normal, normal order evaluation in Lambda calculus. Does anybody know where, um, um, have any views or information on this? Well, um, in Algol 68, they uh, moved on to call by reference. Um, uh, so uh, that, that is some sort of um, evidence that uh, maybe they did intend that call by reference in the first place. But um, incidentally, uh, in about um, this very early 1970s, ICL uh, were um, producing a new range of computers. I've forgotten what they um, what they eventually called it, but nearly all the systems programming that they did for that was in a, a private language to ICL called S3, which was a subset of Algol 68. And, and that used call by reference as, as a way of parameter passing. Um, so in uh, Algol 68 did have some industrial use in a subset um, uh, afterwards. Um, not for very long, I don't think. Uh, yes. My question was really, did they move, did they change because of the uh, uh, implementation and uh, difficulties and inefficiencies? Um, 
and was it originally they really were trying to mirror Lambda characters, which is what you would think, because the description is, is just like normal order evaluation. I'd rather think it was a combination of the two. They, they liked the idea of um, mirroring a Lambda calculus, but uh, later on probably um, realized it was uh, more practical to use core by reference. I also think that there's an argument that it, it might not have been really understood at the time, um, that these ideas, um, so McCarthy, for example, famously got the Lambda bindings wrong in the early versions of LISP. Um, I don't personally have enough familiarity with Lambda calculus to remember off the top of my head exactly what it was, but I know that there were, there were arguments about whether call by name or call by value was sort of better. Um, there's a, a letter written by McCarthy in 1965 where he calls Algol 60, quote, mathematically ugly. Uh, the call by name concept uses irrelevant properties of the names of variables because there's no good way of binding uh, the variables, end quote. Um, and um, there's, a, there's a nice little story about an argument between Peter Landon and John Reynolds about the, uh, the nature of the denotational semantics meta language, um, which I will find <laughs> and, I will, um, and I will describe, but I have to find it. Any other questions? I have a comment on, um, both speakers refer to what was in the air at the time in, uh, in the early 1960s or late 1950s. And uh, there's a, I, I would like to, the comments of, the, of, of both speakers on the use of the word semantics. Uh, modern language theory was very much in the air. Chomsky was, uh, was published and well famous in the 1950s. But just like ideas of um, the ideas of recursion and, and Lambda calculus, it was there, it was around. And in, in writing the Algol report, 1960, they used the word semantics, but in a very vague colloquial way. And uh, when four years later, Peter Lennon comes on and formalizes that, that is the whole new development in itself. And so to me, there's, there's a, a strong distinction between the everyday use of the word semantics, which was a, a very, uh, what was really a buzzword of, of the day, but nobody actually knew very much what it meant. And then uh, Peter Landon and later Dana Scott coming in and, and giving a, a really, formal definition of, of semantics and taking syntax and semant semantics as a formalized relation rather than an everyday use uh, term. Um, well, I'll, I'll make a, an initial comment on that. I think, I think you're quite right that there's, a, that there's a shift in this idea of what does it mean to talk about semantics um, and regarding Chomsky, he was one of the people invited to go to the Formal Language Description Languages Conference, but he turned down the invitation. But it shows how mm -hmm. clearly um, linguists and, and the ideas of people working with formal language theory were regarded in this kind of community. So that was in 1963, they were putting together the invitation list. Mm -hmm. um, and there's also, uh, there's another earlier conference called Working Conference on Mechanical Language Structures, which was held in Princeton in uh, spring 1963, I think. Um, and this was supposed to be, um, it was intended to be a, a mostly kind of syntax focused kind of affair, but the summary remarks about this, which were written by Saul Gorn, show that actually everybody was talking about semantics. And this is some of the earliest published um, uh, remarks of people like John McCarthy. Uh, so mm -hmm. I think John McCarthy there say something like, what we mean by semantics is a function which describes the transition from state to state. And um, mm -hmm. 
So <laughs> Gorn, in fact, argues against that, saying semantics is in the head. Semantics is what I have in my mind when I'm thinking about how something operates. And as soon as I write it down, it's something else. It's not semantics anymore. So I think that's the kind of the, the, the transitional period is that, that sort of 1960 to 1964 kind of period. Tim, you have something to say on that? Any more comments? So uh, I think well, it's, um, no, I don't think I've got anything to add really. Uh, you know, um, it's rather difficult to tell after the event, but um, I, I, th I think Foy has has expressed it very well. Can I um, tell this this anecdote now about uh, John Reynolds then perhaps? Um, it, uh, Sounds good. <laughs> originally, um, uh, it comes from Olivier Donvy, um, and he explains that he was having lunch in France in 1997 with Peter Landin and John Reynolds. And he says, quote, I took the opportunity of a pause in the conversation to venture the question as to whether in their mind the evaluation order of the meta language of denotational semantics was called by value or called by name. Peter and John immediately and simultaneously answered, called by value, of course, for Peter, and called by name, of course, for John. For a second of eternity, they looked at each other. Then it was like they were mentally telling each other, let's not have this discussion again, and the universe resumed its course. End quote. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Mm -hmm. Any any more questions? We can continue a little bit, although we'll run out of time at some point. Um, will this just uh, will this video be available, or the is there a video of it a recording? It, I hope so. I, I, I dropped out, but I think it's going on to the cloud, and Troy has a copy as well. Yes. So one way or another, we'll get it onto YouTube. And the slides as well. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, we, uh, I can, we can link the slides on the uh, BCS Facts website from yeah. the page for this talk. So we'll do that as well, provided the speakers agree, of course. Well, yes. Yeah, yeah, good. Are you happy with your notes to go on, Troy, or do you prefer just the slides? I know the notes is you fine. Tell me. OK. Well, maybe that's a good point to say thank you very much to our speakers. It's been a great to tour de force through early Algol 60. I was wondering when Algol 68 might get mentioned because I, I did use that as well very briefly. Mm -hmm. The seven pass compiler at Imperial College. Uh -huh. <laughs> I love the seven pass compiler because I, as it ran, each time it would find an error, correct it, and then the next pass would say, no, that was wrong. This is actually what you meant, <laughs> and each pass would go on. So you can see why it was a fiasco, I think, from my experience of Algol 68. Uh, but anyway, th thank you for a, a, some, a very nice talk that was certainly not a fiasco to uh, Tim and Troy. We, we can clap, clap if we can. <laughs> thank you. Thank you yeah, very much. It doesn't work that well on Zoom, but anyway, thank you very much. I very much enjoyed it, and I hope everyone else has. It was wonderful to see Peter Mosses and other people here as well involved with the story and Cliff. It's great, absolutely great. great. And we hope to have a, a write-up by John Tucker as well on the talk, which should appear in the Facts Facts newsletter early yeah. in the new year. So I guess it just remains for me to say a ha happy Christmas to everybody. Hope you have a, a good break, whatever you're doing. Stay yeah. safe, of course. And uh, I think we're going to have some more Zoom talks in the new year. We haven't quite decided oh, what. Yeah. If anyone wants to volunteer for a Zoom talk, please get in touch with me. Uh, and then we'll go back to uh, real talks, probably with Zoom as well in parallel uh, when that's possible. But for the moment, the BCS have made no announcement on when, when, they're, when the offices will be open again. So I think we're, we're stuck with Zoom for the moment. But anyway, it does make recordings and so on easier. And uh, we can have people from all over the world visiting we've certainly got at least one person from the US yes. and maybe a few other people who, who couldn't have come otherwise so. exactly but thank you very much and bye see you in the new year happy yes, christmas everybody <laughs> happy christmas bye. happy new year <laughs>